All righty, so we made it all the way through chapter four in one day. That's all right, because it was ifs and if elses and ands and ors and stuff that if you've had any other programming class, you already know how to do. And if you haven't, it's still pretty elementary, right? Because we know what to, it means to do one thing or another. We're gonna go back to the idea of cases though, because I wanna introduce two ideas may have homework assignments based on them. Oops. And the idea is using the switch case statements. Two different ways of doing it. Two different purposes for which we might use. And both of them involve the old way of testing. You know, the kids who grew up with iPhones and Androids may not ever have even had to do this, but back in the old days, I wish I would go away. If you texted somebody with their cell phone, Right, it looked like this. That's not the best picture. I'll find a better one. How about keypad? Right, like this. And if you wanted to send somebody a message that said hello, you'd press 4-4 four, four to get to that H, 4-4. Four, four. And then to get to the E, you'd press 3-3. Three, three. And then get to the L, you'd press 5-5-5. Five, five, five. And then to get to the L again, you'd press 555, five, right? And then to get to the O, type in uh, 666, six, six, right? To get to the O. So if you needed to type in ABC, you'd press 2 to get A. You'd wait a second and you'd press 2-2 two, two to get B. And then you'd press 2-2-2 two, two, two to get to C. And it was quite laborious. So fortunately, we don't have to do it that way anymore. However, we're going to write an app that takes a string and turns it in to a series of key presses like that. And we're going to use switch case so that if they type in H-E-L-L-O, we find out what they need to type in for H. We find out what they need to type for E, for L and L and O. Let's go ahead and set that up. We're going to ask for their input, and then we're going to have a loop, even though we haven't supposedly hit the chapter on loops yet, I don't think. We're smart enough to do it. Make a C++ console project. That's weird. I've never used this Windows desktop wizard thing. Don't think I'm going to. Console app. We leave this as lecture H. No, don't update it. All right, right off the bat, we're gonna start getting fancy, just because, and we're gonna put this part of the lecture in its own function. But firstly, let's do the usual. We're gonna include string, because we're gonna ask for input. And then let's do using namespace std. And now we're gonna define a function called, I don't know, cell underscore text, right? So void space cell underscore T-E-X-T, parentheses in parentheses, and then inside our curly braces. Now we're gonna call that from down in main, right? So cell text, like that. All right, down here, Let's ask them for the name, and then let's pass what answer we get into the cell text function, right? So we need to, a, to define a variable here that will capture the data that we pass in. So string text, that's what they're gonna type in. Let's ask them to enter some text. 
enter your message to text and we can get all fancy and ask for a phone number and stuff, but we're not going to do anything with the phone number. So let's not bother. In quote, semicolon, and then CIN greater than, greater than text. And once we get that text, we're going to pass it to our cell text function, right? Just take that text and convert it to the numbers and print the numbers out. So they don't have to figure out that they need to type in 444 and 111 and all that stuff. All righty, so we have a string and we need to get the individual characters of it out. Now I'm gonna try a special form of for loop to see if it works and I'm not really expecting it to. And the Python classes I just taught and then C Sharp it would, I'm not sure it'll work in C++, so I'm gonna try it. For every character CH, in the string, see out that character. See, it's already complaining. No? Maybe it's gonna work. Let's give it a shot. This is a specialized kind of for loop. And if you've taken Python, it looks for real familiar, except you use the word in there, and you didn't have to have a variable type there. Anyways, I wonder if it's gonna work. So I'm gonna run the program. See what happened? Oh, come on. I don't want you to be big. I want to leave this thing down like that. All right. Give it a shot. Oh, now it is complaining. Well, because I've messed the syntax up, right? When I was showing you Python, I forgot to change it back to C++. Enter your message. Hello there. All right. Well, it did hello, but it didn't do there. And the reason for that is that if you use arrow arrow to get your input, like we did here, it only gets in one word or number at a time. So we need a different function. And there's one called get line. I'm gonna Google it up, make sure I know how to use it, C++. CIN get line. Never anything wrong with going and getting an example. You just don't want to copy and paste big, you know, 20, 30, 40 line chunks of code. All righty. Can I have a demo rather than just an explanation? Here's an example. All righty. So you can pass in a string array, but I'm hoping that we can actually just pass in the string itself. And then you call cin.getLine and then the name of a string and a maximum number of characters. All right, let's see if that's gonna work. Hey, come back. All right, so I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'm gonna try this. cin.getLine parentheses our text string and we don't really need to let them type in more than 80 characters, right? You're not liking that? I really thought we could do it that way. I know there's in the PowerPoint coming up. I don't want to waste more time doing this than necessary, but I really didn't want this to work. String space get line space C plus plus. Get line string. Just like that. Didn't I do that? Oh, well, apparently you don't put a number in. You don't specify the number of characters. Yeah, I did it again. Come back. All right. So maybe if we get rid of that, it'll work. Is that not our example? Why are you hanging on me, gang? If I just type in all this code, is it gonna work? Copy and paste it, because it looks to me like exactly what I have.
Oh, you have to specify where you're getting it from. Okay, I've got the syntax all wrong because when I copied it from the first one, it was the wrong one. All right, now it's good to go. Let me get rid of this example. Okay, so here's the get line function. Let's explain what it does. Arrow, arrow just gets in one word or number or anything up to the point where you have a space or the enter key, right, or tab. Up to a space or tab or enter key. All of that's called white space. It's so-called tokenizes. And that's not an important word. It's not gonna wind up in your exam. It tokenizes the input so that if you type in CIN greater than greater than A, and this is your input, hello there. The first time you call it, A will equal hello. And then the second time you call it, then B, come on, oh, you, B will equal, I am having trouble typing, will equal, forget it, there, right? So if that's our input, and then we type in CIN greater than greater than A, and then we type in CIN greater than greater than B, like that, if that's what our program's asking for, then A will equal hello, and B will equal there, right? So it's tokenizing the input, it's chopping it up based on the spaces or the tabs of the inner key. So to get an entire line of text at once, to read an entire line of text at once, without tokenizing, right? If it has spaces, you want to use get line. So get line, parentheses, C-I-N, and then string name, right? Like that, that's how you call. It. So I'm gonna copy this and put it down here. And if we look at that telephone keypad that we had up here, how did you get a space when you were typing in messages way back when? Either one of y'all remember how you signaled a space? Oh, here it is. You hit the pound sign. That's what it looks like. That's what I'm seeing in this one. or you hit the zero key, this one's saying. Yeah, yeah, let's go with this one. You're gonna press the zero key if you need a space. And I have no idea what that fancy symbol is, but we know how to get a space. All right. Okay. So up here, we have a for loop that's gonna pull our characters out character by character. So after we call get line, right here, let's move that uh, C out message and all this stuff right above it. So I'm gonna cut that and paste it to here. So it's all in a row. I just want it grouped together nicely. We're gonna ask them to type in the message. We're gonna call get line so that they can even use spaces and it won't read in until they hit the enter key. And once we get it stored into text, we're gonna call our function cell text. Then we, that leaps the code up to cell text so that we can use a for loop to get that character out. And since it's a character, we can do a switch case on it. Now we could do if character equals a print two, else if it's a B print two, two, else if it's C print two, two, two. But we're gonna make it fancier and we're gonna take advantage of fall through. And it will make sense in just a second. So let me type it in without explaining why it's gonna make sense. First, so if you get a C, you need to type in 
it needs to type out a two because A, B, and C are two. And then if you get a B, you need to print out another. Two. That seems to be giving me grief now. Oh, I, that's supposed to be the word case and not C out. And then if it's an A or an uppercase A, you see out one more two. Now, why did I set it up like that? And then you break. Well, remember the way fall through works is if it gets to here, it's gonna print out a two, but there's no break statement, so it's gonna continue and fall through and print out another two, and then it's gonna print out a third two, right? So if you have a C, it's gonna print three twos. If you have a B, it's gonna jump down to here, print out two, but there's no break, and so it's gonna fall through and print out that two, and then it breaks. Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to copy that and paste it and just change it to D, E, and F, right, to print out threes. So D, E, F, D, E, and F, except those are supposed to be caps, weren't they? And I forgot my semicolon there. If you want a copy of this text, I'll post it into uh, the chat in just a second. D, F, and E, and D. All right. That was more mistakes than I wanted to make, right? But D, E, and F, D, E, and F, A, B, and C, except for D, and E, and F, and you print out threes rather than twos. And let's add zero for a space, right? So that would just be the first case, right? Space or case, single quote, space, end quote, right? In that case, we're going to print out an, a zero. Maybe not even a, yeah, just like that. Okay. And then we break because we don't want to fall through and do the twos and stuff like that. Let's test out what we got so far. Enter your text, your message to text. I bad fed, All right? And so this is looking sloppy. Oh, it's because I'm printing out the letter itself. I don't want to print out the letter itself anymore. So let's find out where I was doing that right here. And let's instead change that into a comment. Use a switch statement to press the cell phone touch pad, right? Or keypad to send the text message. All right, so dad fed cab, right? Death. I'm using only letters that we've actually implemented. And it prints in, but we need some kind of space, don't we? Between them. So maybe after the A, we also need to print out a space, right? And maybe after the D, we also need to print out a space. And maybe after the zero, we also need to print out a space. And that way, if they need a C, it's going to print out two, two, two space. And then when they need an E, it's going to print out three, three space. And after it's all done, after the end of the switch, 
let's see out an ENDO. Go to the next line in case we were going to ask them again or something. All right, enter your message to text. Bad, deaf, fad, dad, Abe, right? It's still going to the next line each time. But maybe it's working, two, two, and then followed by a single two, and then followed by a three to get the D, and then a zero, okay. Anyways, I think it's kind of working, but it's going to the next line. I don't want it to go to the next line each time. Oh, this probably needs to be outside of the switch because it needs to be outside of the for loop. I don't know if that's gonna do it. That doesn't seem like it'll do it to me. All right, and this is the end of the function. This is actually the end of the loop. That's not the right place for it, and I'm slightly confused. Let's give it a shot. Maybe it is the right place. Maybe we got it going, and I just didn't realize it. Abe, dad, death, feed. All right. So there's the A, right? And then there's the B, and then there's the E, and then the space is a zero, and the D is a three, so D, A, D. Yeah, that's all looking good to me. All right, so sneak preview. Your homework is just going to be to expand this with the rest of the letters, right? so that you can go all the way out to Z. And we need a default case. C out, parentheses. Unrecognized character, colon, followed by what they typed in, right? So in quotes, less than, less than, ch, less than, less than, a closing parentheses, followed by a space, and then a break. That way, if they type in something we don't recognize that we haven't entered or some kind of keystroke we're not gonna support, like question marks and stuff, Right, like if we type in hello there, dad, it's not gonna know most of them, right? It doesn't know what an H is. It doesn't know what an E is. It doesn't know what an L is. But after you add the other cases, it's gonna work, right? So homework. Finish the cell text method to handle the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G through Z. All right, I'm just going to copy and paste this as is, right? Because once we clutter it up, it's going to be harder to do, harder to keep track of. So why don't we just tuck that away separately, maybe in a new file, new text file. All right. So all your changes are gonna be inside the switch statement, right? So your changes will be new case statements inside the switch statement. All right. Hopefully that shows up over in the source files or something. No, oh well. We'll, we'll find it.
Maybe if I do a save as I can, we'll find it. I just won't close the window. How about that? Is it in here? Where's it put it? I don't know where it puts it. All right. So that's the first part of the homework. Does that make sense, gang? All right, that's one use for this case statement. And as a matter of fact, that's probably enough. I'll show you what I was going to do extra, but I think we can get away with not doing it. Back in olden days, like in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s, maybe even up in the 70s, I don't know. You know, people would give their phone numbers using letters as well as numbers. And yeah, that even continued, you know, like in the 90s or whatever, when, when you'd have, you know, fancy phone numbers on the TV screen. But anyways, they were used for prefixes, like, you know, I was going to dial Fred 7, 3, 4, 5, 6, because I lived in the Fred area code. Now, Midwest City's prefix was called Regent. So Regent 7, you know, 5567, five, or Regent 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, or Regent 2, you know, uh, 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 whatever. And you use the first two letters. It was the first two letters that was important. And I guess the telephone company didn't think that people could remember phone numbers that were seven digits long, and that's why they did this. But if we look up in that touch keypad, or one of those good old-fashioned circular phone dials, right? Rotary dial. phone. Don't look at one of those. Maybe here's one that we can read. Oh. How about we just leave it as rotary dial? There we go. Well, no, that one doesn't have the letters on it. It's too old. Maybe if I look for large images only. Yeah, right, right here. Just like that, right? And so what is an R? It's a seven. And what is an E? It's a three. So our phone number would, if it was Regent 39999, you take the first two letters, seven and then three, and then Regent 37339999, or Regent 2732999, or Regent 7, R E. 79999, like that. And so, like, Oklahoma City had different codes that they used, you know, old telephone prefix examples. Uh, they were called exchange names. Well, that's taking a while. Add Oklahoma to our search phrase. So Pennsylvania stood for PE. Can't find one. Oklahoma City. 
old Oklahoma City. Really? Can you stop? Oh, great. Just crash. I don't care. Well, anyways, these don't have the words. Oh, uh, here's the word. Like Susquehanna, you were supposed to type in 77 SU and get a 78 and so on. This is no way to search this. I really would like for that other one to work. It looked like it was good. Good to go, but it's not working. All right, Windsor. So in Oklahoma, some people had Windsor, some people had Jackson, which is 5-2. Some people had Parkview, which is 7-2. Sunset, which is 7-8. I'm not recognizing any of these numbers. Anyways, Pershing. Pershing is also a 7-3, I believe. Yeah, 7-3. Shady, shady side five. Anyways, anyways. So we could do the same thing with switch, right? We could make it so that if they wanted a G, an A or a B or a C, we'd print out two. Let's go ahead and code that in and, and just maybe not do all of it, right? What are we gonna call that? We're gonna call it phone prefix. Void phone prefix. And so let's just declare a string called prefix, right? And we're just going to take the first two characters of it so that if we passed in something more than that, we need to chop it down to two. I can't think of a way to do that, so let's just leave that alone. Well, why chop it down to two, right? You know, if you're going to call 1-800-JAVA-LOVE, right, we'd want to be able to do all that too. So let's set it up the same way. For every character CH in the prefix, and let's just set up a, a prefix, right, like regent. Or let, let's just set up the whole phone number, you know. R E seven three four five six like that, and then now we're going to figure out what to dial. So we need more switches, more cases for an A or a lowercase A, and for a B or a lowercase B. And for a case C and a lowercase c, all of those are a two. Why give me grief there? Oh, because I forgot to switch. Switch based on CH. Curly brace, tab everything over. That's A, B, and C. We would need to do D, E, and F. There's an extra quote there that's messing us up. I need a closing brace to match this opening one. I wish it indented it properly, but it doesn't. Why are you complaining about C out? See how it is ambiguous. Oh, because I have too many closing braces now. You're going to fix yourself? All right. And so for D, E, and F, that would be a three. So I'm just going to copy and paste that. D, E, F, D, E, F, and so on. So instead of doing R, E, let's just do something else. Like if they live at bagel seven... You know, so B A. Wait, no, I want something that has both of them. 
I don't care. B E seven, right? Or bad, right? Bad three four five six. That's going to be my phone number. Now why? Okay, and these needed to be lowercase letters. That's why I'm getting errors here. Errors here. D E and F. And A B and C are a two according to the telephone dial. And a D E and F are a three. So it's old school, right? It, it's it's not like texting on a cell phone touchpad, but it's still converting letters to numbers. It's just more primitive. The good old telephone keypad like that. Sure is an ugly picture for all it being a large resolution. There we go. Anyways, you get the idea now. So let's run it and watch it print out our phone number bad one, two, three, four or whatever it was, right? So going back to Visual Studio, I'm going to call the phone prefix code. Heck, we can call it up at the top of main, right? Phone underscore prefix. That'll be good enough. And let's run it and watch it turn those phone numbers into numbers or not. What happened? Phone prefix should have started running. Oh, I put that in the wrong place. Phone prefix should have been a call down in Maine, right? Maybe the first thing in Maine. Try it again. And there it is, right? Whatever our phone number was, what it only printed out the, uh, part of it. I probably didn't have break statements in it. Yeah, I need a break here, right? Because we don't want fall three through. We don't want it to print both a two and a three. We also need a break here. And we need a default case. If we don't recognize it, we're gonna just print it out, right? So like if they type in a seven or something, well, I guess we could handle that right here, right? If they wanted a two, then we're gonna print out a two. Seems silly, but you know, we can do it. If they want a three, then we can print out the three. But I still want a default case to handle all the things that we might not otherwise be expecting, like dashes and parentheses and stuff, right? And if we get something like that, we just want to print out the character. And then after our for loop, this is the end of the switch. This is the end of the loop. And so after the for loop, we want to see out an ENDL. Go to the end of the line. Press the red air square to stop the debugging. Run it again. All right, and so whatever that number was, bad three, four, five, six, to call bad three, four, five, six, you would have typed in two, two, three, three, four, five, six, right? And unrecognized characters are not gonna be right, right? The letters, we've only supported the letters A, B, C, D, E, F. So if we had changed this to 1-800 Java space love or C, yeah, well, we're not learning Java, but whatever. There it is, right? 1-800-J, but we, it does know what an A is, and in V, and it does know what an A is, L-O-V, and it does know what a three is. All right, so phone prefix. I mean, I guess we could make that part two of the homework, right? Finish the phone prefix function. 
so that it will print out numbers for all the letters according to the old rotary dial number letters. And I'll paste a picture into the homework, make it easy to see. Okay, so let's copy and paste this into our And let's make it menu based. We're getting all fancy here, but why not? Down here in main, let's ask them what they want to do, right? So string choice. And so what are we going to do? We're going to ask them, do you wish to a or one send a text or backslash in, right? See out two. Dial the phone. We'll let them type it in, right? CIN greater than greater than choice. If the choice is one, right? If the choice equals equals quote one end quote, then we're going to do this stuff down here. not going to be with the notes anymore, but that's okay. Right. So if the choice is one, they're going to do that. We need to put curly braces around it. Menu based program, offer them some choices. Else if choice is two, else if parentheses choice equals equals quote two end quote, you know what, if they type, this in, if we made this an int, we could leave the quotes off. But let's just leave it like that. And so if the choice is equal to two, we're going to call phone prefix. But let's modify phone prefix to take in the same kind of thing that the other one did, right? So where we do string text and we read in the text and then we call the function, right? It's what we want it to do, except we're going to change the text message. Enter the phone number, example, 1-800-PROGRAM. <laughs> and then we'll call phone prefix with that variable, but for that to work, we're going to have to pass this text variable in, aren't we? We've got the text variable, we're passing it in, but we need to go and modify the phone prefix function to accept that text. So I'm going to come up here, and phone prefix needs to take a text message, right? So string text, meaning I can get rid of that, and I need to replace that with the word text. All right, so let's run it and test our menu out. Whenever you have if, else, if, you should always have a message that says, you know, unrecognized input. So if choice equals one, else if choice equals two, else see out choice is not recognized right backslash in in quote semicolon all right the menu is looking kind of ugly so i'm going to work on that a little bit do you wish to let's do it like this backslash in in quote followed by that number there, but maybe we tab it over, make it easy to read, right? Need our semicolon at the end of the print statement. See if it looks better now. Right, do you wish to one, send a text or two, dial the phone, let's choose one. Enter your message to text. Well, that didn't work. And the reason why is when you start to mix, 
C out, excuse me, CIN arrow arrow and get line, it messes up. If you're gonna use get line in one place, you really ought to use get line everywhere. And that can be a drag. All right, hi Shinji, glad you're here. So we need to replace this choice with another get line statement. And that's unfortunate, but the only other way to fix it is to so-called clear the input buffer. And honestly, it's just easier to change this one message to look like that, right? So read from CI in our choice. That way we're using get line everywhere. The side effect of that is that if we use get line, all it can read is a string. But that's all we're asking for, right? Are strings. Even if it's a number, we're reading it as a string. So that's why we have the quotes around the numbers. If we had to, we can convert those strings to numbers that we needed to. I don't think we have to. All right, do I wish to text, send a text, or dial the phone? So I'm going to send a text, enter your message to text, fade, bad, dad, right? It doesn't know what a D is. I thought we had done Ds. A, B, C, D, E, F. Maybe we don't have a break statement in there. I'm gonna go and look at our code here. Yeah, we didn't have a break after the F and the E and the D. You gotta have that. And what if they wanted to type in a number? Well, I don't know how to handle that. You always had to handle that in some special way. All right, try again. Send a text. See, I'm glad we added this. There was a bug in our program. Would have asked you to do homework with a program, with a buggy program. So bad, dad, no, not like that. Def feed, right? And so there is the BAD and the DAD and the DEAF. Yeah, it's working now. So let's run it again. Do you wish to send a text or dial the phone? Let's dial the phone. And we're gonna call 1-800-FED-9999. And so that would mean 1-800-333, just so because F and E and the D are all in the same place, right? Nine 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 nine. Now, how about we make it loop until they want to quit? That's easy to do. We just have to need a, a choice that meant quit, right? Like zero to quit or Q to quit. We can do that. So down in our menu, we're going to do C out lesson lesson quote parentheses Q means quit, backslash in, end quote, semicolon, like that. But all of this needs to be in a, min, in a loop, right? It needs to just repeat. So let's make our string variable here, and then we're gonna do while choice not equal, quote, capital Q, and choice not equal lowercase q, just in case they typed in either one, right? Now I'm gonna to have to put all the rest of it inside a curly brace. So I'm gonna to have to highlight all of this code and tab it over. Except maybe the notes, right? And we don't wanna print out unrecognized choice if it's a q, so we better put an if statement here, right? if else choice equals two, why don't we just put it up here at the top? If choice equals equals quote Q or, whoops, that's not or, two vertical bars or choice equals equals lowercase Q, then let's print out okay, goodbye. Else if choice is equal to one, 
then ask for the message to send. Else, if the choice is equal to two, ask for the phone number. Now it should loop. I'm going to send a text. You need your message to send. Fed up. All right. So it knew what FED was. It knows that a space is a zero. It didn't know what a U was, and it didn't know what a P was. It's worked looking pretty good. How about an extra space there, you know, in front of our menu? We're being nitpicky, but why not make it look as good as possible? So I'm just going to print a backslash in there, right? Put a blank line there. Make it look pretty. Try it again. Send a text. Fed up. Now it's asking us to do what? Let's dial the phone. 1-800-ABE-FEED, right? Whatever. And that's 1-800-223-3333. And that's good, right? Because E's and F's and D's are all on the threes. And A, B, and C are all on the twos. So I think we're good there. I think we have a good program. I'm going to copy and paste all of that into the file that we're gonna be sending out as text. And if anybody wants these notes right now, I'll go ahead and send them to you. Of course, I always upload them as well, so no big deal. And let's send that to you in the chat command. All right. You use the word and instead of and in the loop. Did I mean to? No, and I'm surprised that it worked. Unless C++ suddenly started supporting the word and, I honestly don't know how that worked, Anna. Thank you for catching me on that. Huh, how in the world did I work? Let's go back and look at the code. Is it flagging it as a syntax error and I didn't catch it? It's news to me if they suddenly started supporting the word and. Wow. I don't know. Okay. Well, let me fix that. Send you the chat and then we're going to take a five minute break and come back. Thank you for catching that. That was, that's weird. All right. Okay, cool. Short break, gang. All right, gang. I may just start the next file as, you know, part two or something like that, because I think this one's pretty good as is.
Actually, I think that's it. I think we're ready to move on to a new chapter. Okay, so we need to talk about exams. Let's plan on having the exam next Wednesday. And don't panic. The exams are open book. They're open loading up Visual Studio and typing away. They're open um, sending me chat messages. They're open raising your voice and talking, right? You can do all that stuff. And if you talk and everybody hears you, that's fine. You know, you ask me to explain question three, I'll explain it to everybody, not just you. So usually we have a lot of people make good grades on them. So we'll spend like the, uh, you know, the first half of class or the second half of class or whatever on Wednesday going over it. I mean, uh, doing that. If you can't be here that day, then contact me and we'll make other arrangements. It needs to be proctored. So I would like for you to take it with, you know, with me. I want you to be here, take it during class time. And on Monday, we'll have a short review over it. Could probably do the review right now. Probably makes sense to do the review right now before the end of class. Be over the first four chapters. I don't think it's fair to introduce, you know, material on Monday that has to be on the exam. And so since we've covered the first four chapters, then I think we're good to go. Wouldn't you also, couldn't, absolutely. I could use a do loop. A do loop is perfect for that kind of thing. It's absolutely perfect. Why is a do loop perfect? Because it always repeats at least once right and that's perfect right so we could have made it like this do this stuff affect it on you in a way it even looks better right while the choice is not equal to q i think the reason i shy away from do loops is just because in python they're not there and i'm so used to giving you know examples in in python and c plus plus that i sometimes and to forget the things that C++ and Java offer that Python doesn't. So there we go. Excellent choice. Excellent choice. Very good. All righty. Let's go take a peek at the next chapter anyways. We won't go so terribly far into it because we're going to want to review for the exam. I'll post the notice about it so that everybody, you know, notices it. It's coming up. Hope everybody can come even though, you know, y'all are the only three folks who've been coming me uh, during class time hope everybody can come but if they can't then we'll make other arrangements all right let's go get chapter the next chapter's notes we're making good progress through the book Did my upload ever work? Having problems with the last class, getting the file uploaded. 54%, okay, it's still gone. It's good enough. So loops and files. So we know what plus plus does. And I've talked about the fact that you can prefix the plus plus before the variable or you can put it after it. If you put the plus plus in front of the variable, it happens at the very beginning of the statement. So like if I do this, A is equal to three, and then I do B is equal to plus plus A, what happens? A immediately cranks up to being four, and then it gets copied into B. So B and A both equal four. However, 
if I did, you know, C is equal to three and D is equal to C plus plus, now we see where the name of the language came from, then if the C, if the plus plus follows, if it's a postfix notation, then it happens afterwards. So the C gets copied into the D, so three goes into the D, D is equal to three, and then C increases into four. And then of course, minus minus works the same way, it just is called decrement. So increment and decrement. Let's write those down as, as nice words to know, even though. Plus plus means increment. Minus minus D means decrement. Prefix syntax, like plus plus A. The plus plus is the first thing to happen in the expression. It has high operator precedence. Postfix syntax, isn't that a fancy way of saying it? Postfix. Us English speakers usually call it suffix, don't we? Like that. The plus plus is the last thing to happen. And so if you say A is equal to three and then B is equal to A plus plus A, I'm just doing the same example, then B and A equal four after this. If you do C is equal to three, and you do D is equal to C plus plus, then C equals, then D is equal to three, right? Because the three gets copied into the D, and then the C is equal to four, because the C gets incremented. Same exact thing is in Python, where you can say C plus equals one except you can also put it in front like that, right? And if you like saying C plus is equal, C plus equals one, if you like typing that because you got fond of doing that in Python, that's also totally okay. It's just most C and Java developers would do that. And so you may as well learn that syntax. It's good to remember this one though, because that adds two to it each time, right? C times equals three. I don't know why I said each time. <laughs> C times equals three, right? Multiply C by three, store back into C. So add two to the value, store back into C. You know, and then you could do D divide equals two, right? Divide D by two, store back into D. And then minus works the same way, of course. E minus equals seven, right? Subtract seven from E, store back into E. Well, if we're gonna do it like that one, then why don't we make it B? All right. That's increment and decrement. Why are we talking about those? Because you use them in loops. That's talking about prefix and postfix. I already talked about that. Notes on increment and decrement can be used in expressions. Result is equal to num1 plus 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 minus minus num2. So if we said num is equal to three and then num2 is equal to four, what would happen? Well, this adds one to num2 immediately, so that's five. No, it doesn't, it subtracts one from it, right? So num2 drops from four to three, and then that gets added to num1, so three plus three gets stored into result, and then since this one follows it, that one gets incremented afterwards. So result is equal to six, num1 plus plus increases num3 to four, and minus minus num2 lowered into three must be applied to something that has a location in memory. You can't do this, num1 plus num2, end parentheses, plus plus. Maybe that looks like it should say three plus four and then add one to it, but the plus plus means take whatever is in here 
and then add one in it and store back. That's why I was taking the effort of saying store back into B. You know, if you did this, A plus B plus plus, error, <laughs> right? Because otherwise it would mean add one to A plus B and store back into A plus B. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Introduction to loops, the while loop. Haven't we already talked about these? We know what a while loop is. X is equal to 10. While X is greater than zero, C out X, right? And then subtract one from X. You could even put those in the same line if you wanted to, right? You could just do this. Did not mean to add so much white space, but I did mean to come here and do X minus minus there, right? Then we're only doing it in one line. And we've already said before that if your block of code is only one line long, you can do it like that. So X equals 10, is X greater than zero? Sure is, print out X. And then afterwards, subtract one from X. So X is nine, come back up. Is nine greater than zero? Sure is. Print it out, change it to eight. Is eight greater than zero? Yeah, print it out, change it to seven. Keep doing that until it is no longer greater than zero, right? So this would print 10 through one. So with this, I'm gonna change that to the word 10, two, one. How else could you do that? You could do it with a for loop, right? For int i is equal to 10, keep running as long as i is greater than or equal to one. I just did that for, for grins. And then i minus minus or minus minus i, either way would work. C out, Y, followed by MDL. And it's just one line of code. You could remove the braces like that. Or our do loop, right? Start X off at equal to 10. Do this. C out, X. Remove one from it and keep doing that while X is greater than zero. If we put the minus minus in here, then we could move it down to one line, but I think I'm gonna just leave like this one like that. A little bit clear. Okay, so you see the syntax of the for loop. Usually you have three steps in a loop. You have the init step, initialization, you have the comparison, the condition, the comparison has to be true for the while loop to continue. And then you have the update, right? You gotta update the variable or else it's likely to be an infinite loop. And of course you have a body of code as well, right? It needs to actually do something useful. So you have a body, so Loops usually have, have an initialization. How about we just say initialize, condition, and update steps. And since it's plural, why don't I get rid of that? A for loop does all three of those things in one place. You initialize your variable, you have your comparison then and your update. And the order that these happen is a variable gets initialized first, and then the check happens. And if this check is wrong, right, keep going while X is less than negative one, right? Well, I is not less than negative one, so it's not gonna even do that. It would just skip it, right? Just like we said, while X is negative one, it wouldn't go in here. But anyways, you have your initialization, you have your comparison, 
After the comparison happens, it does the body of the loop, just like a while loop does the body of the loop, and then there's an update. So initialize, compare, body of loop, and update. So while and for are called prefix, pretest loops. The test happens before the body. The test condition is evaluated before the body executes. A do loop is a post-test loop. The test happens after the body. This means the body always happens at least once. Always is performed, executed, whatever fancy word you want to use, at least once. So when do you use each one? Well, while is considered an indefinite loop, right? Choose one, two, or Q. We don't know how many times a user is going to choose one before they finally get around to choosing Q, right? It's indefinite. We cannot, as programmers, predict how many times in advance. On the other hand, if you want to count from 10, one to 10, that's a definite loop. So if you are counting or stepping through a series of values, four loops are usually the best. If you need the body to run at least once, no matter what, a do loop is best. In all other cases, especially indefinite loops, I'll just say in all other cases, use a while. And honestly, there's nothing you can do with a do loop or a for loop that you can't use with a while. A language could get rid of the for and the do loops completely and still work with while, right? Just as we proved, right? We wrote a loop here and it was a while loop. We redid it as a for, we redid it as a do. You can't create a for loop or a do loop, pretty much. I, I, I'll say that with 99.999% certainty that you could not replicate with a while. However, for loops are good for definite loops, or at least usually that's how they are used. Used for stepping through values. Now, why did I say usually? You can be silly and use a for loop for something else. And what do I mean by that? You could write it like this. Enter a number or negative one to quit, right? And then you could have your read that in to a variable. And then you could have four and you could just skip initializing anything, right? So you don't put anything in front of the semicolon and you keep running while number is not equal to negative one and then the next time you need to run, you get the input again, right? And then inside here, we do something with the number. I don't know what, you know, that'd be the body of the loop. And then we need to ask for the, the uh, value again. Now in this case, it's just a while loop in disguise, is it not? But you can do that. You can leave this front part off if you don't need to initialize anything. It's possible we could just, we could do this as well. I'd be curious if that would work. Looks stupid though, right? We have that and we have that, but it's an indefinite loop. We don't know how many times it's going to repeat. I'm going to take that out. I don't, I'm not convinced that would work. There's no reason not to use a for loop like that, but it is proof that you could write a for loop that yeah, whatever. That is not a definite loop, but usually they are. So where was I commenting on that? For loops are usually definite loops, usually used for stepping through values. While loops are usually indefinite loops. Repeating 
until some condition turns false. However, you could use a while loop for counting, right? In which case it is a definite loop pretty much, right? This counted found from 10 to one. But usually you can use a for loop like for that because the syntax is cleaner, isn't it, right? We just did all that in one line rather than the four lines plus braces it took to do it with a while loop, right? If we count the braces, that's six lines of code that we did in two lines of code here because he didn't even require any braces. Much cleaner syntax. I usually use for loops as often as possible unless it's something silly. You know, if it is an indefinite loop, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bother. If you leave off part of the for loop, that's fine. I could leave this part off and it would work just fine. It wouldn't update it. It'd be an infinite loop, but it compiles just fine. Or if you leave this part out, it'll run forever. It'll be an infinite loop unless there's a break statement in here. Break statement causes it to exit the loop, but you can leave that off as well. You leave all of it off. You can take all three of those things out. I'm not gonna until I undo that. Yeah, right. I could do this. And that's the same thing as a while true loop. It just repeats forever. It doesn't do any initialization. There's no condition that'll ever need to turn false. There's no update to it. So it'll just run forever unless there's a break statement somewhere in it. But if I'm gonna write a while true loop, I'll put the keywords while true because that's more instantly obvious. So that's a while loop, the while loop structure. That's the expression, the condition, the test. As long as it's true, it'll keep doing this. If the test is false to begin with, it won't even execute it. That's why we say if you need the body of the loop to perform each at least once, don't use a while loop because if the expression is false, it won't go in it. Is the expression true? Then do the statements. If the expression was false, it would just fall straight through without doing it. All right, how the while loop works. We know how it works. Flow chart of the while loop. We know what a flow chart, we know what a while loop is. We've talked about it being a pretest loop. This will never execute because the test is immediately false, right? If it's equal to six, it's not less than equal to five, it's not gonna do any looping. Example of it, yeah, watch out for infinite loops. An infinite loop, is one that repeats forever, usually because there's no code in it that can make the expression become false. And usually when I'm typing demo code for students, I'll do that. I'll say while x is less than 10, and then I'll forget to put the x plus plus, right? And so the number just stays the same and it never executes a loop. That's called an infinite loop. The only way an infinite loop can break is if there's some kind of break statement in it. And that could look like this. While true, keep repeating forever, it's infinite loop. See out, enter number or negative one to quit, right? Enter score or negative one to quit. And then CI into score, we can declare the variable, right? And then if the score is equal to negative one, then quit. Break, excuse me. If score equals equals negative one, then break. Else do the body, right? Whatever we were supposed to do. Print out the number, right? Add it to the sum, do something with that. Let's declare a sum variable. And each time they enter a score, we'll add it to it. I don't know why I meant not actually entering this into Visual Studio. Uh, hopefully it's easy to read. Right, so sum plus equals the score that they typed in. Right, so there we go. It's gonna keep repeating until they do that. And sure, we could set this up with a do loop somehow, but we're still probably gonna have some kind of if statement that makes sure that what they didn't type in is a negative one. It'd be about the same logic, right? Do this and then get the score and ask for it. So get the score, and if the score is not equal to negative one, then add it to the sum, right? Sum plus equals one, and you could keep doing that while 
score was not equal to negative one, right? And if you're gonna do that, score had better be defined outside of the loop because otherwise it's not gonna be a variable here. It's a local variable in that case. It's not available here. Hey, come back. All right, so I'm gonna subtract that and move it above the do. So that would just repeat until they typed in a negative one. Same as the other one. It's up to you how you wanna do it. Things like this are just you know programming style. I like this one. I think this is clear. If you think this one's clear, go for it. You could even do this one with a while loop as well. It would not take much jiggering to do it with a while loop. Hope that makes sense. Example of infinite new loop, number is equal to one, while the number is less than or equal to five, print hello. Nothing ever changes numbers, so this condition, condition never becomes false. So, a loop where the test condition never becomes false is an infinite loop. While, one, while true, C out infinite, that's an infinite loop. Int number is equal to one while number is less than or equal to 10. Print the number out, that's another infinite loop. Because there's no update, right? Without the update for the number variable, the number never quits, or the loop never stops. So it is an infinite loop. So we probably forgot to add the number plus plus command. We just do that. There. Warning, infinite loop. That makes sense? A loop is infinite if the condition never becomes false unless there's a break statement in it, like we used here. And if you're worried about your break statement from a switch case causing your loop to exit, don't worry, because that's inside the switch keyword, right? It's inside the block for the switch statement. And so it just causes it to leave that break statement. It doesn't cause it to leave a loop. Using the while loop for input validation, ask them for a number. And if it's wrong, don't let them leave the loop. So say they had to type in one, two, or Q, right? or enter a score or negative one to quit. If their number was anything other than that, then we would not want to let them exit. So that's an example of a data validation loop. A score cannot be below zero or above 100. Yes, this teacher does not allow extra credit we will let them enter negative one to quit. So the only valid data is negative one up through 100 or up to 100, right? So see out a message, but we're gonna get our input. This would be another good case for a do loop, I think, right? So let's declare our score. And what we're going to do, we're going to see out less than, less than, enter score 1 to 100 or negative 1 to quit. Right? Like that. And then we're going to see that into the score. If they've made a mistake, we're going to yell at them. So if the score is less than 
negative one, right? Or this score is greater than 100, it's a problem. And we're gonna tell them so. See out invalid score. Right. And then now down here, we can actually use it. Now that we are sure we have a valid score, go ahead and use it. That makes sense? Data validation loop, it's a loop that repeats, makes the user repeat until they get a good piece of data. You can also use a break statement for the same thing, right? Eh, let's not even demo it with a break with a with a break in a while. So the while loop can create input routines that reject invalid data, repeating until valid data is entered. Read an item of input while the input is invalid, display the error message and read it in again. That's doing it with a while loop rather than a do loop, right? This is using an in, a priming read, right? Because you gotta read it just like you gotta prime the pump. You never used a pump, you have to pump at it until some water starts coming out, that's the priming read. And then you keep pumping until your bucket is full or whatever. So C out, enter a number less than 10. Then we type that in. While the number is less than or equal to 10, we yell at them, invalid entry, enter a number less than 10, and then we read it in again, right? And so yeah, you, you can do a while loop to do the same kind of data validation, right? Another example. I don't like this style because I don't like having the input done in two places, right? It feels better to me to have only one piece of code that lets them type in the input. So if you use a priming read, you have to get the first piece of data and then you get, if it's wrong, you get the data again, right? In two separate steps. So-called priming read, right? And then if bad data, read again. And a priming read can be used inside any data entry loop, right? We could have written this one, the while loop here. Where'd it go? Where we were adding to a score. We could use a priming read here and write it as a while loop. Be another way to do it. But as I said, I'd rather write our code so that we only have one place where we read the data in one line of code. So read the first value. Is the data invalid? No, then fall through and use it. Yes, display an error message. Then read another file, N value. And it keeps repeating like that. Counters. We know what a counter is. It's a variable that increments or decrements, right? They're also known as loop control variables. And we're gonna stop after this and we're gonna do our short review, right? A counter is a variable that is incremented or decremented, right? It gets initialized, and we've been using counters the whole time, right? And then it gets compared, and then it gets updated, right? and you do something with it, whatever you wanted to do with it. So, this counter loop goes from one to 10. Counter variables are often called loop control variables. The loop control variable for this line, for this loop is X, of course. Right? Has to be initialized before entering the loop. Here they have an example, does the same thing, except they got fancy. 
and made a minimum number and a maximum number. And then they have their while loop go while the number is less than or equal to the max number, right? Same business. Your last loop doesn't have a condition at the end. Will that work? Oh, the do loop. You're probably right. Let me go look. <laughs> You're so right. Okay. And we're going to keep going while the score is less than negative one and or the score. I did it again or the score is greater than 100. That's our repeat condition. Thank you very much. You're better at noticing do loops than I am. Very good. All right, we got through what page? Let's just take a note here that we got through page 28. Chapter five through page 28 on the PPT. All right, let's review. Do some review for chapters one through four. Your best review, or at least a very, very good one, is to do the quizzes. So I need to go in and check to see who has done the quizzes, right? I need to grade the chapter three quiz. Chapter four should be due as well. Let's put a due date. I'm going to make us an aggressive due date on it so that people are done with it by Monday. But of course you can wait and you can do it after that. It's just that it's going to be better for you in exam wise if you've already seen it before. So let's put a due date on that. Normally I don't make things due within a week, but I think this is important enough to do that. All right. So you're just going to review the quizzes. Right, you're going to take the quiz if you don't make a good grade on it. Anyways, text me as soon as you're done with the quiz and ask me to go grade it rather than wait a while. Right, just say, I finished the quiz, can you go grade it? And that way, you should get an immediate answer. Right, I mean, yeah, I might be busy, but I'll still get to it as soon as possible. So, let's look at chapter four's quiz. What will the Boolean value be equal to? x is equal to 3, y is equal to 3, b is equal to x equal equal y. Well, these both are equal, so that's definitely true. b would be true. Here's a not equal sign, right? x is 3, y is equal to 3, b is equal to, is x not equal to y? No, it is not true that x is not equal to y, so b would be false and so on, right? Down here, there's a place about switch statements. And you're just gonna need to make, take care to notice whether there's breaks or not. This one's written well, so if A is equal to two, it's gonna print green, right? The next one, there are break statements missing. So if A is equal to two, it's gonna print green, blue. It shows this conditional operator here. Remember how to evaluate them. A less than B, question mark, 30 colon 40. Well, is A less than B? It sure is because 10 is less than 20. So the 30 gets copied into D. If this was not true, if A was not less than B, then 40 would get copied into D. So yeah, you're just gonna wanna do that. If you have quizzes waiting, send me a text message. You know, I'll, I'll grade everything as often as I can. I'm gonna grade you know, quizzes tomorrow. 
try to get them done as often as possible. But if you're waiting, let me know. I'll hop on it so that you can take it again. All right, so I'm gonna sneak a peek at the exam as is. Make sure there's nothing, make sure there's nothing weird in it. Taking me a minute to pull up, sorry gang. Alrighty, like one question asks, match the following data type to the appropriate value. And right, if it's an int, you're gonna match it to a whole number. Example 10, right? If it's a float or a double, right? Then it can have a fractional value, right? If it's a character, it's gonna have single quotes around it, right? Something like that. If it's a string, it's gonna have double quotes around it, something like that. If it's a bool, it can be either true or false, right? You know how to do operations, right? So if you'd have one plus two times three, what is that equal to? It's equal to six. Why? Multiplication happens before addition. Due to operator precedence. What is operator precedence? Parentheses happen first, then multiplication and division, and modulus, right? And then addition and subtraction. So if you call these P, right, for parentheses, and you call this M and D, and you call this AS for addition and subtraction, right? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. It's just that we don't have an exponent operator, right? So there's no E in here, right? <laughs> but you get it. Modulus, you know how it works. Six modulus three, what is that? zero, right? Three goes into six two times with a remainder of zero. How about seven modulus three, right? Seven modulus three. That's one. Three goes into seven two times with a remainder of one. So that's modulus. If you have something like this, A equals one, B is equal to two, C is equal to three, D is equal to A plus POW, C to the power of B, and then you have D plus plus, right? Then what is D after that? You don't type it into the computer, well, yeah, you could, but with semicolons after it anyways. <laughs> one is A, two is B, C is three, so D is equal to A plus, so that's a one, POW C to the B, three to the power of two is nine, so that's equal to 10, but this increases it, right? So at that point, D is 11. Match the following operators to their meanings, right? 
Just know what that does. That's an increment, right? Know what that does. What is that? That's a single line comment. You know what modulus means. You know what curly braces do, right? They enclose bo blocks of code. You know what parentheses do? They group expressions. Groups parts of expressions or encloses the parameters of a function, right? So x plus, you know, y times z, that's a use for it, or void, you know, test x comma y, right? The parentheses enclose the parameters or they grouped expressions, parts of expressions, right? You know what greater than greater than does, right? Reads input from the console or whatever. It just reads input, right? You know what that one does? Writes output. So if you have a little program like this, right? Pound sign include IO stream, and then you have int main, and then you have some kind of statement, int a is equal to three, while a is less than 10, c out a plus plus, NDL, right? So that's going to print out the numbers three through nine. Hope you can see that because it's going to add one to A each time. And then it's going to return from the loop. And so I could ask you, what are keywords? Well, the keywords are int and they're nicely decolored, right? On our editor. But anyways, int is a keyword. While is a keyword. And return is a keyword. Then what are the variables? Well, this one only has one, A. What is the preprocessor command? Pound sign include. And what are the operators? Or what are them? Yeah, what are the operators? There's more than this, but there's equal, and then there's less than, and there's plus plus, right? Those are our three operators. Or I might give you these things and ask what they are. What are int, while, and return? Those are keywords. What is a? It's a variable. What is pound sign include? It's a preprocessor command. What are these? These are operators. Hope that makes sense. If you have something like this, x is equal to three, true false. The new value three replaces, destroys what was in the variable x before. And that is true, right? Once three gets copied into x, it's gone. The old value is gone. What is the using statement we use? It's always just using namespace STD, right? I need to modify this question. I need to fix this question. But 
What is CMath for? Pound sign includes CMath. What do we do with that? That's math functions like POW and ABS, right? What is IO stream for? That's for streams like CIN and CIO. What is string for? That one's pretty easy. The string class. That's about enough of that. I'm gonna modify it because there's some other ones there and I don't feel like having them in there. I don't remember if we talked about IO manip. I don't recall that we have. IO manip has things like set W to set the minimum width of a number when you're printing it out. I need to delete that from it. I don't want that. Whoops, why'd I close that? So explain why 1010 equals six in base 10. You don't have to write a paragraph on it. You just say six plus, excuse me, four plus two equals six, right? Because here's your ones column, your twos column, your fours column, and your eights column. And I got it wrong, right? So it's eight plus two is equal to 10. Trust me, I'm not gonna get it wrong in your exam. Oh, I got it. Yeah, equals 10 and base 10. Tell you what, why don't I make it look like 11 there? Why does this equal 11 and base 10? Because that's an eight, that's a four, that's a two plus a one. So eight plus two plus one equals 11. So how do you declare a variable? Give it a, a type and a name, right? Like int x string y. How do you initialize a variable? Give it a type, name, and starting value. Int x is equal to one, string y is equal to bob, right? like that. That's the difference between declaring and initializing. Is C++ case sensitive? It absolutely is, right? So it's case insensitive. Know how if statements work. We've done if statements a lot. Remember integer division is important. If you have an int divided by an int equals an int. So if you say x is equal to five, y is equal to two, c out x divided by y in deal like that. <clears throat> Don't even have to put the parentheses around it. Mm. Five divided by two is 2.5, but since they're both ints, rounds them down. Good thing we're ending the class soon because I'm running out of voice, right? Two, not 2.5. So an int divided by an int equals an int, so round it down. What if you want to convert directly? You use a cast, right? You could do int x equals the integer version of y. Let's use new variables. Let's declare one called d, right? So double d is equal to 3.3, .3, right? And x is equal to int d. Then what is x equal? It rounded it down to a 3. There's several syntaxes, right? There's also this syntax, which looks like Python. Same thing. And then there's a complicated one. Static underscore cast 
less than d, whoops, less than i and t, greater than x, right? Same thing, just more complicated. The book shows all three of them, so I'm mentioning all three of them here. All right, binary values, I really hope you know them because there are two questions over them. Like, what is zero, 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 zero? That just equals zero, right? Zero, 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 one, that equals one. Hope you know why. Why did I do that? Why did I type in zero, zero as well? Of course it equals that. How about one, one, oh, oh? That's eight plus four equals 12, right? And so on. One, 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 oh, eight plus four plus two equals 14. How about all that? That's eight plus four plus two plus one. Names cannot have spaces in them, right? Names cannot begin with a digit, and they can be letters, numbers, and underscores. Microsoft is non-standard and also allows dollar signs in your variable names. How many operands are in a binary operator, right? What are operands? They're the values that the symbols work on. Right, so if you have three plus two, plus is the operator, three and two are operands. So plus is a binary operator because it needs two operands. So it's multiplication and division so is and and or, all of those are binary operators, even equal and equal, negative, right? All of these are binary operators because you have to have something on each side of them. Almost everything is a binary operator. Do remember the uh, x is equal to three, y is equal to is x less than six, question mark, one colon two. Since x is less than six, y will equal one because x is less than six. So this business about binary division even if you have this, double D, and then you say D is equal to X divided by Y, right? And then you C out D followed by E and DL, what's it gonna print? I don't know if it prints two or 2.0, but at this point D equals 2.0. And you go, why? Five divided by two is 2.5. It's true, but again, these are integers, it rounds down. Just because we were trying to store it into a double doesn't change that law. Again, int divided by int rounds down. All right, and then what if I ask something like this? Write some code that does this, right? Display, what is your favorite number? And then read that input into a variable named x, add one to x and display my favorite number is followed by x, right? 
write some code that does that. If I ask you to write some code, don't bother with the pound sign include, don't bother with int main or whatever, don't bother with um, the using statement unless I ask you to. And I'm not gonna ask you to. On the other hand, if you do bother with those, if you write the program into Visual Studio and then you paste it into the answers, whatever, I'm not gonna count you off, right? What can hold the largest value? Long, long or long double? Well, no matter what, a double can hold larger than any int value. We don't even have to stick the word long in there. In Microsoft C, a long double is just the same as a long, so it doesn't matter. A double can always hold larger than an int value because it supports exponential not um, notation. All right, let me Google up something. And eh, maybe I can just write it on the screen with annotation. Where's annotation? I never can find it. Here it is. I want to draw with a pencil. How come there's no pencil tool? All right, if you have x over y, 2y, this is supposed to be a 2. OK, make it a 3. 3yz, <laughs> right? How would you express that, right? So if you said a is equal to that, x over 3yz, turn that into a formula. three Y Z plus one, right? Turn that into a formula that C plus plus can support. All right, how do I stop annotating? There we go. So turn that into a formula. A is equal to X over, and we have to put all the rest of this in parentheses, don't we? Is it just three Y Z plus one? Looks great, we're done, right? No, we're not. The computer doesn't know that a Y and a Z and a three next to each other means that we're multiplying. We have to add that, right? It'd be a good idea to add the semicolon as well. So know how to write expressions. Three AB means three times A times B, right? If you Google up a formula and it leaves out the multiply symbols, too bad you gotta type them in, right? I'm giving you almost every answer here, so hopefully it's not gonna be too hard of an exam. but I'm leaving a few out. So, which is a four byte int type? And the choices might be int, float, double, or long, long. Right? Those could be your choices. Int, float, double, or long, long. The int is the correct one, right? Int is a four byte. What is an eight byte integer type? Long. 
what is an eight byte, excuse me, long, long in this language, at least on Windows. On Mac, you can just use the word long. On Linux, you can just use the word long. What is an eight byte integer type? Wait, we've already done that. What is an eight byte floating point type? Double. Okay, so questions. When should you use get line? And the answer is when the input contains a space. Really, that's about the only time. If you want to read in an entire line spaces, like you're asking for an address and they need to be able to type things in with spaces, you better use get line. That question needs to be deleted. So does that one? So does that one? So does that one? Or maybe I'll just give you the answers. Um, okay. Definitions. What is a value that does not change while the program is running? It could be cons called constants and it could be called literals, right? Constant x, constant int x equals three x will always be three and the program can't change it. The programmer has to change it, right? If you do C out three times two, right? Or just C out 3.14, right? 3.14159 is known as an unnamed constant. And it's okay to refer to this file during the exam, which is gonna make the exam real easy also known as a literal. It's literally typed into the code, right? One question over there. This is also known as a magic number, it just appears in the middle of the code out of nowhere. It's better to give it a name, right? It'd be better to give that very, that literal a name, right? Double pi equals 3.14159 and then C out pi less than EL, right? Because otherwise that number is a so-called magic number. And yeah, we recognize that, right? Because we say that and we know math and stuff like that, but there are lots of numbers in the universe that you wouldn't know the meaning of. Truth tables, if you have or, like x or y and the result, and you have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, right? Then or means if either one of them is set, right? But if they're both zero, then the result is zero, right? But if either one of them is set, the result is one, right? Or you can replace the zeros with truths. Excuse me, there's zeros with false and one with true, and that'll be a logical truth table. This is a binary truth table, but a logical truth table is the same thing except with Fs and Ts. How about and? And means both of them have to be set, right? So, Zero and zero is zero because not, neither one of them is set. Zero and one is zero because they both need to be set. One and zero is a zero because they both need to be set. So this is an and and this is an or. Why don't we get rid of this annotation? Well, now I don't know how. I guess I could bring the annotation tool back and there we go, clear all drawings.
All right, and the last bit of code is look at this code and see what's wrong with it. And there'll be like three things wrong with it. And I'm not gonna tell you what they are in advance, right? Maybe a semicolon is missing. No, that's not it. But you know, that could have been one of the things that was wrong, right? Or maybe, anyways, I'm not gonna give you, you know, maybe I use these things like this and I use the wrong ones. I use greater than, greater than, rather than less than, less than. Again, that's not it, but it's stuff like that. So you just have to look at the code and see what's wrong. Maybe I mixed up single equals with double equals, right? Maybe I put a semicolon in the wrong place. Things like that, right? Could be anything like that. And that's the last problem. So we are done with the review. Let me save this and give it to y'all as well. Oh, I guess I already did. Okay, so let's save this and post it to chat. And I'll upload it as well, of course. All right, let's post a notice about the exam and make a Dropbox so you can upload your review. Your homework. So this was chapter five up to what? I think I already wrote that down in the notes, but it's page 28, if I believe. Of course, the video's wrong at this point, the notes are wrong, all that, just ignore all that. And I typed in 20 rather than 28. Let's fix that. I see your chat message, I'll fix that in just a minute. All right. Test is Wednesday evening during lecture time. If you can't make it then, let me know. So just come on to just come on Zoom and dig it. I'll give you the password during Zoom, for example. Make sense? All right, gang, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna stop the recording.